Hey yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to the O'Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thanks for the download. Hopefully your time is repaid with an upload of consciousness-enhancing audio, or at the least, a uh, critical think or two. And who better to have a critical think with than the man whose name is on the marquee for this featured presentation. His name is Chris Knowles, and he is the synchromystic mind behind The Secret Sun, a blog that, in my opinion, should be required reading for any open-minded types out there. Some of you are already no doubt aware of Chris's work on his blog, and if you are not, you'll get a crash course here. But just a crash course, not a not a deep dive, because Chris is so much more than just his blog. He's also the author or co-author of three books, The Ego Award-winning Our Gods Wear Spandex, The Secret History of Comic Book Heroes, The Complete X-Files Behind the Series, The Myths, and the Movies, and also The Secret History of Rock and Roll. Chris has also had a career in the advertising, publishing, and entertainment fields, and all of that forms the basis for our chat here about Jack Kirby, Black Magic LARPs, and if you're on Patreon, The Siren of the Philosophers. Enjoy! So, Chris Knowles, welcome to the show, man. Really appreciate you being here. Looking forward to the chat. Great to be here. Definitely, yeah. First time, long time of your blog here. I hate to do this because you are so well-known and prolific in the blogger sphere, but for people who don't know you or haven't heard you yet on a host of other podcasts, tell them just briefly a bit about your background and what your blog, The Secret Sun, uh, attempts to shine light on. Well, the blog I've been doing for 11 years now, had a couple breaks and did work on a sister blog for a while. So they've been, you know, it's not been contiguous 11 years, but for the most part, started doing the blog to promote a book I published in 2007 called Our Gods Were Spandex, The Secret History of Comic Book Heroes. And the point was originally to promote the book, but also to develop ideas for the next book, which I wasn't necessarily sure was which form or shape it was going to take. And then it kind of took on a life of its own because that took you up until the 2008 election cycle, which was just a bombardment, an avalanche of uh, esoteric symbolism being used for whatever reason. And the thing just kind of went from there. I have been working in the pop culture industry, so to speak, for, golly, uh, 31 years now, working on merchandising and, and advertising and those sort of spheres, that, that corner of the, the, the pop culture world. I had done some comic books back in the 90s, short-lived. Uh, one was a miniseries and one was an unintentional miniseries because unfortunately it was published during the crash when the, the market just completely bottomed out and have been involved in a number of things. It grew up in the music business. My mother was a professional musician. I, In high school, I palled around with a bunch of friends who were in uh, very prominent hardcore bands in Boston. So just, you know, the whole realm of communications and media and and advertising and all those communicational forms I've been in and out of for uh, most of my life. So literally most of my life, you know. Some of my earliest memories are um, playing with match uh, book cars in, um, or match box cars, I'm sorry, in uh, the, the lounge of a um, big nightclub that my mother was a performer at, a, a nightclub that was owned by the mafias, incidentally, so... <laughs> And it was later burnt down in an arson fire. Um, but that's another story. Anyway, so that's just, you know, that's me in a nutshell. Been blogging, doing a number of podcast appearances, have done a number of uh, appearances in different documentary films. You know, so just basically um, somebody who just spouts gibberish opinions and people seem to pay attention to them <laughs> intermittently. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. Well, tell people, you know, your blog really hinges on this idea of synchromysticism. Tell people what that actually means. Well, that's a term that was coined, I believe, by Goro Adachi, but there was some sort of dispute between he and another blogger who was active at the time as to who might have actually invented that term. Synchromysticism is basically, well, I look at it as just basically applying the principles of dream analysis to popular culture. So in other words, if anyone has kept a dream journal and sort of done work on it, you know, whether you look at it in, in an archetypal sense or in a 
you know, more Freudian kind of sense. It's basically taking those principles and applying them to popular culture. And I, I see popular culture as part of, you know, the collective dreaming. And by popular culture, I, you know, just all forms of mediation, essentially. You know, all narratives that are, are spun through the media, I think, can all be analyzed and broken down symbolically. And so I take the, uh, I don't know if necessarily want to call them the skills, but I take sort of the methods that I had um, stolen from from Carl Jung in his book, uh, Man and His Symbols, and, uh, you know, apply them to popular culture. And, you know, for the most part, I sort of look at things that are you might see more as unpopular culture, <laughs> you know, sort of corners of, of the popular culture that have manifested themselves in very interesting ways. You know, interesting personalities that seem to well, at one time, were marginal. I mean, certainly uh, Philip K. Dick was marginal for most of his life before Blade Runner and all the other films that were made from his work. And, you know, Jack Kirby was, you know, fairly marginal uh, outside of comic circles until his visions basically took over the uh, multiplexes. And, uh, you know, just sort of on and on. You know, I just look for these strange attractors that seem to resonate outside the world of, of media and ideas and, and have correspondences to real life events. And, and I think that might be what separates my work from a lot of the other synchro mystics. I mean, Goro is sort of doing his own thing. It's, it's very much influenced by the work that Richard Hoagland had been doing in the 90s on the Enterprise mission, uh, you know, sort of takes that ball and runs with it. But, you know, what I sort of do, what I try to do is look at how symbols bounce back and forth to events in the, in the real world in meat space. Rather than saying, well, you know, this symbol showed up in this movie and then it showed up in this movie. And, you know, to me, that's like, it's interesting, but it's not really what I do. You mentioned a couple of names in there that I think people are familiar with. Obviously, Philip K. Dick. We've talked on this show about, you know, this Philip K. Dick reality that we seem to be living in now. You also mentioned mm -hmm. Jack Kirby, the uh, legendary comic book creator. And you actually wrote uh, pretty recently, back at the end of August, in one of your blog posts, that our popular culture is becoming increasingly Kirbyfied. And I was just curious, what do you mean exactly by that term, Kirbyfied? Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, sure. If you look at all the big, uh, big Marvel films, especially, but even the DC films, they're taking concepts that come directly from Jack Kirby's comics. So maybe sort of a broad example would be the Black Panther movie. I mean, the Black Panther was Jack Kirby's creation, essentially, um, you know, with Stan Lee. But Kirby in that partnership was very much the creative driver. Wakanda, you know, all those sort of things were very much Kirby ideas. And then we have like the more blatant, not blatant, but more overt Kirby tributes in films like Justice League, which has, you know, the, the whole thing with Apocalypse and Parademons and so on and so forth. I mean, and any number of Marvel Universe films, which, you know, it's interesting, too, because a lot of this work, when I was a kid, I, I got into comics in the early 70s. And um, I was very young, very, very young. And Kirby had sort of fallen on the other side of the, you know, the track, so to speak. I mean, he was very much a dominant force in the, in the 60s. And then the 70s, other ideas sort of, you know, things became more realistic. And his stuff was getting more cartoony because he was having a lot of problems with his eyesight. But I think that his work in the 70s at a time when he was very much on the outs of comics fandom was absolutely visionary. And that's why we're seeing so many of those ideas that I grew up reading in comics that pretty much most of fandom hated making, you know, billions of dollars in, in all these various movies, Marvel Universe. But, you know, again, not limited to Marvel Universe, uh, DC Universe. I mean, he did a lot of work for DC. But, you know, I mean, this is a phenomenon that you can track back to at least to Star Wars, because Star Wars is rife with ideas taken from Kirby's work. I think that's fairly acknowledged, you know, in comic circles, maybe even some film circles that Star Wars is, is basically, you know, it's Flash Gordon plus Jack Kirby. So we're just seeing that take place in the popular culture, but also in the way science is, is, is moving and, and technology and, and, you know, even so many real life kind of things. You know, I talked about this story that he had done in 1974 that was um, very much a um, sneak preview of the, the Iraq war. And he had a character that looked uncannily 
like Saddam Hussein and it was found, you know, was taken from an underground bunker like Saddam Hussein was. I mean, it's just, it's really uncanny to see. And, you know, the charges that he was faced with in an international court were the same that, that Saddam had faced. And at the same time, he was working on another series where, you know, he was talking about the Stargate and, you know, all these kind of really wild ideas that have really become, um, you know, certainly very prominent in, in say, ufology and, the, and you know, the fringy world, so to speak. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned your book earlier, Our Gods Were Spandex, that came out in 2007. That's rather curious, uh, maybe synchromistic timing, considering that was right on the cusp of the birth of this Marvel Cinematic Universe that's captured everybody's imaginations in the last decade. Did you tap into this timeline or this wavelength back before you even really got into the blog and started tracking all of this stuff because like i said man that's some curious timing that you put out that book with that theme at that time that's a good question because i started working on that book it was part of a larger book on pop culture in general and and actually our gods wear spandex was just a chapter in this other book and i was kind of looking at see here's the thing i mean I've been around for a you know, pretty long time. I mean, I'm 52 years old, so I've seen a lot of these cycles come and go. So I just see the way the patterns work, that things manifest themselves in the fringes and in the underground and sort of the marginal spaces and work their way into the mainstream. So I just saw these themes building up in you know the comics world and i was writing about it because I, I used to work uh, i was an associate editor and columnist on a, on a magazine called comic book artist uh, which was a fairly popular magazine in the 1990s won a number of awards so i've just been sort of tracking this for for a number of years and everything is cyclical you know and i just saw these cycles sort of re-emerging and it really ties back to a, a book in the 1990s called Kingdom Come, which was very much a, obviously, it was it was a very apocalyptic and, and, and highly religious, uh, the, the main creative driver, and it was a, it was a phenomenal artist named Alex Ross, whose father was a, a minister. So he had like a very, had a lot of religious training in his childhood. And he, he put the context of the apocalypse, you know, he peopled it with superheroes. It all became like a battle between these various factions of superheroes. And um, it was an extremely influential book that just changed the whole context of the, the comics market, which, you know, for a number of years in you know, the early 90s had become very grotesque and, car you know, bulging muscles and bandoliers and bullets. And it just became like, you know, this ridiculous kind of orgasmic fantasy into something, you know, highly derived from Christian apocalypticism. And, and I think that, that that infusion, I mean, it really always been there. I mean, it's always been. You know, it's part of the culture, so it's going to be part of the popular culture in, in some form. But it, I think it became more explicit. So just the whole tenor of the, the, the narrative and the medium changed to really depicting these, these characters as gods. And, and I saw, you know, in the wake of, you know, 9-11 and the Iraq War, uh, the Gulf War, I'm sorry, and the Iraq War, actually, that these things were going to have profound resonance in the culture. Speaking of apocalypse, let's fast forward now. It seems like two worlds have collided in the past several years. Our physical world here and the symbolic or archetypal world that traditionally occupies, I guess, what we would call our subconscious. That world seems to have become conscious almost and is bleeding into physical reality here. I think you'd agree with that. And if you do agree with it, what explanation do you have for why that's happened? I think a lot of it has to do with the fact, you know, this constant mediation, you know, social media, the Internet. There are fewer screens, you know, the screening systems that filtered out a lot of these energies in, you know, the way people could communicate with larger groups of people has totally changed. And I think that a lot of it is perceptive. You know, a lot of the way we saw reality was a misconception. It was faulty perception on our part. So when we have a number of people such as myself saying, no, look at this. Did you notice this? Did you <laughs> look at this over here? Did you happen to notice this? I mean, this is really, yeah. this doesn't fit the program. You know, this is the glitch in the matrix. Maybe you should take a look at this, you know, and it, and it goes up and down the line, you know, and across all various kinds of spectrums, people's consciousness changes because what they, are able to and what they choose to focus on changes. I've always thought 
since I was very, very young that, you know, the world as it was presented to us was just basically a lie. And, and having been in the media such as it is, you know, whatever my experience has been, just seeing, you know, I, I think the thing that really struck me was, was advertising, you know, when I was working in advertising and, you know, it's the business of lying. It's the business of, of telling lies, you know, usually more often than not, predominantly, you know, what, what we would call white lies, you know, just nice little, like, I'll give you an example. Right around the time in 9-11, I was working for Nabisco and I was working in their um, art department, you know, working on um, presentations, sales presentations and things like that and storyboards and all these kind of things, you know, just a basic advertising and promotional material and they had this whole concept of you know make sure that everything looks appetizing make sure this looks appetizing and so you'd have this like like a chips ahoy cookie which just looks like a lump of dough i mean not even dough it just looks like a lump of plaster or something it's just, it just look doesn't even look like food and you know you were instructed to, to to use certain colors and certain textures so it looks appetizing you know and all these things that you know to, to look appetizing and it, it kind of reminds me there was an old mad magazine story and there was this whole thing about like you know you, you get an old gi joe and it's in this box and you see this phenomenal painting uh gi joe in some sort of adventurous setting and you know the lighting is all dramatic like, everything was very cinematic and then you open the box and it's just a stupid little doll you know <laughs> just like completely <laughs> inert and you know i mean that's the power of i mean it isn't just advertising it's it's you know point really what um uh, packaging and things like that are they're, they're basically um, point of purchase advertising. You know, it's it's in store advertising. It's it's the power to draw your eye to to product. And you know, I did a lot of toy packaging, and the toy packaging was really about you know taking these very inert looking action figures and and making them look exciting to people. You know, and uh, I mean that's not necessarily deceptive because you know you have this clamshell package and you can see exactly what you're getting. Yeah. But at the same token, it's it's packaging a narrative to make something look like what it's not. I, I don't think it's it's dishonest. I mean, it's just it's again, it's it's advertising, it's promotion. But you know, there are a lot of advertisements that are, are unbelievably deceptive. And you know, and I sat in meetings with like ads and 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 product managers and all these kind of people are talking about. Well, we've got this crap. We've got this junk. A lot of times it's stuff that's bad, like in the case of uh, Nabisco, you know, stuff that's just like, yeah. I mean, it's barely yeah. even food. It's just sugar and, and, and GMO flour. You know, how do we how do we sell this to people? You know, stuff that they don't know that they want and they really shouldn't be consuming at all. But this is this is what we get paid to do. And in a lot of ways, they get paid very well. And, you know, in, in Nabisco, I mean, if, if you wanted to be in a, a senior position, you know, even in the art department, you had to have an MBA. So, I mean, these are very well-trained, intelligent people, but you know, just basically they're selling garbage to the American public. I mean, they're, you know, contributing to the obesity, diabetes, I mean, all these unhealthy things. The point I'm trying to, anyway, the point I'm trying to make here is that before we had the ability to explore alternative narratives on a larger scale, we were really hostage to these narratives that were presented to us through these very constricted avenues. You know, I mean, when I grew up, there were, I don't know, five or six TV channels and I mean, a couple of UHF channels. You didn't have access to a lot of information. You know, when I grew up, people was, you know, AM radio was still the predominant way that people listen to radio. I mean, FM radio took over later in the 70s. But you had a, just a very small stream of information available to you that, that determines how you see the world. I mean, you know, you know about all these psychological experiments that have to do with the expectation and perception and you know the way people frame things, you know, they see things that they're not actually seeing because of, of of the power of suggestion and the power of perception. So I think once that monopoly was broken, that people started to see the world differently. And the problem is, is that there are so many competing narratives and there's so many toxic agents within the system. I think it's just, it's breaking, you know, it's certainly breaking down any kind of consensus. I mean, the world that I'm living in now is entirely different than the world I grew up in. And people just don't see things the same way because they're not tuning into this, you know, they're not watching MASH every night. You know what I mean? Like everybody watched MASH every night. So they, they have this sort of common 
language to speak, and and that's entirely gone. So, what role has the occult played in this? Then you know these ancient belief systems and philosophies have these contributed to this apocalypse that you refer to in a uh, a positive way or maybe a more nefarious way? Both, really. I mean, because occultism, as we understand it, is really it's a symbol system. When you really break down to it, it's a symbol system. It's it's interpreting events and you know what you would choose to define as reality through symbolic systems, right? The zodiac, the tarot, you know, grimoires, amulets, talismans. I mean, all these things are very highly sophisticated symbolic systems that have been refined over centuries, and in some cases, millennia. So First of all, there is no occult, you know, technically. The, the term occult became developed through the late Middle Ages that had to do with all this information that was coming in from the East that the church frowned upon. So it was occulted. It, it, was, it was hidden. The people discussed it in, in, they discussed it in secret societies and all these sort of smoking rooms and, you know, men's clubs and all these kind of things. You know, men would get together and talk about the things that they weren't allowed to talk about in public. So that's that's really technically what the occult is. I mean, what the occult has come to be known as, you know, it's the same thing like comic books are not comic books. They're not books and they're not funny. I mean, they're, they're predominantly stories, you know, pamphlets about superheroes punching each other. You know, and that's like another kind of magic, the way, you know, we can turn words completely on their heads and change the way people expect to see words. You know, and then, again, it's all part of this process. But, you know, what people describe as the occult is really either divination or some sort of attempts at contact with beings outside of our normal everyday world through the use of symbols, right? I mean, that's 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 really what we're talking about is 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 the use of symbols. You know, not only the zodiac, but the but the actual constellations and the constellations. You know, they don't exist; they're entirely imaginary. But they're used, you know, not only by you know astronomers, but they're also used by people involved in astrology and and you know star magic. So. Basically, what we're looking at is we're looking at symbol system. So to answer your question, symbols, you're being bombarded with symbols constantly. You know, never mind the fact that language itself is symbolic and writing itself is symbolic and mathematics and all these kind of things that we need to communicate with each other are, are, compl- are entirely symbolic and have you know, very deep and, and potent roots in, in you know, ancient understandings of the world. But when you get to a commonly referred to as occult symbolism, they're very potent things because, you know, the whole idea that a picture is worth a thousand words. I mean, you know, when you show the eye in the pyramid or, or, you know, an inverted pentagram or, you know, whatever kind of symbol, quote unquote symbol that people generally tend to recognize and understand. I mean, it comes, it's a trigger to a a whole host, you know, like a whole universe of of associations. So we when you see those symbols, it triggers a number of, uh, of different associations in your mind. So what we're seeing in the media is creating associations with different realities. And, you know, all these occult symbols don't belong in, a, say, a, you know, a Katy Perry or a Beyonce video. They don't belong there. You know, they, they have no reason to be there, but they're inserted there for you know particular reasons. And, and it all has to do with with changing the, the minds of, of the public and, and moving things in different directions and so on. You know, you don't even necessarily need to be like, have some sort of cosmological conspiracy behind this. It could just be that, you know, certain designers and certain producers and certain directors, you know, are interested in these symbols and, and want to see how they are responded to it by the public. Well, I think, Chris, tell me if you agree with this, that when you look at <laughs> The constant bombardment of advertising and marketing materials combined with the rise and, I guess, ubiquity of the Internet. And then, as you were just talking about, this seemingly increased presence of occult symbolism in media and politics and, I guess, just the general news cycle as well. I think that that triumvirate that sort of led us to this mass psychological fracturing or disassociation, would you agree with that? Oh, sure, yeah. So how does one, I guess, from your perspective, how does one protect themselves from such a thing? You know, I mean, we've all dealt with traumas in our lives, and now we're dealing with more, whether we realize it or not, you know, we're just being bombarded by all these messages all the time. How does one protect themselves from that, from your perspective? 
Well, you know, it's interesting because we talked about Jack Kirby and there's a story about Jack Kirby that I, I think is kind of answers your question in, in a sideways fashion. Kirby, when he was young, I mean, his parents were immigrants from Austria, which, of course, was Austria-Hungary at the time. They were living on the Lower East Side. They were very poor. And he had gotten very sick with, I believe, scarlet fever. And they couldn't afford doctors, so they called in these rabbis who were exorcists. And the rabbis essentially cured him. I mean, he survived scarlet fever, which was usually a death sentence in, in that kind of context. The whole idea was that they had to understand who these demons were that were plaguing him, you know, that were making him sick. Who, who were these demons? They, they had to know their names, you know, because in order to exercise control over demons in classical uh, Jewish folk magic, you have to know their names. You know, I mean, that's one of the purposes behind demonology. And that certainly became very popular, you know, with the rise of the grimoires in, in the Middle Ages. So to make a long story short here, I mean, if you understand what these symbols are and the fact that they are being targeted at you and that they are being manipulated by any number of players across any number of spectrums that you could possibly name, I think it's a form of inoculation. I mean, that's kind of what I see that I am involved with on the blog is inoculating people against the symbols that most people are absorbing either subconsciously or semi-consciously. And I think, you know, just the way those rabbis were able to call out these demons because they understood their names. I mean, if you understand these symbols, you know, and particularly where they come from, you're less beholden to them. You're, you're less subject to them. So what I try to do is show you where these symbols came from and why and how they became recognized to be what they are and how they're being used you know, in all these competing narratives on social media, on commercial media, up and down the line. So I, I think that if you understand what the, what you're seeing, what you're looking at, you're not as beholden to them. You know, and I really do believe that because I, I really believe these symbols have, have a power beyond just being marks on paper that people understand in a, in a particular fashion to represent A, B, and C. I think that the, the symbols themselves have power. The symbols themselves are not just, you know, a bunch of scribblings, but are themselves, you know, that they have a power over people who don't even necessarily understand what they mean. You know, there are certain um, symbols from, from grimoires and you know, certain magical texts that I have no clue what they mean, but I recognize their power, their inherent power, because I, I believe that they do have an inherent power. Whether it's a power that was discovered or that's a power that had been invested into them by people who, you know, are much more well-versed in magic than, than I will ever be is, is open to debate. But I, I just generally believe that these, these symbols do have power. And I believe that these symbols make things happen in, in the world. You know, and this is, again, this is an understanding that I, that I took from Jung. You know, I, I did a lot of reading. I mean, more than 20 years ago now, but, you know, I did a lot of reading on his, particularly his, his understanding of symbols, and I think it really changed the way I saw them. We all know what the most, I mean, traditionally the most potent exorcism narrative of all time is, is William Peter Blatty's, and, and of course, William Friedkin's The Exorcist. Now, why the Max von Sydow character was so much more effective at drawing out this demon than Father Karras character was was because he knew who it, who they were dealing with. You know, he knew what this demon's name was, what its history was, how it worked, how it operated. I think that there's a very interesting uh, kind of metaphor for people to work with in that regard. That's actually a decent segue, I think, into, as we're talking here, your most recent blog post from October 23rd. It was called It's No Game, and it's, <laughs> it starts off with a rather hot take, and I want to share that with the audience here if they haven't read it yet. But you wrote that there's so much stupid out there that sometimes it gets pretty hard to figure out which particular flavor of stupid takes the cake but my vote goes to all these idiots who dick around with black magic in hopes of scoring virtue points with twitter blue checks and by that i mean numbnuts who screw around with hexes and curses in hopes of making some kind of political statement however garbled end quote there so this is you writing about this brooklyn bookstore <laughs> who recently hosted a public ritual to hex brett kavanaugh which you went on to call a larp why the hot take here about this? What's your beef with this sort of thing? Well, I have a number of them, and it's not just me. 
one of my um, readers had pointed out that John Michael Greer, who, who you're probably familiar with, feels the same way that I do about this. First of all, it makes magic look ridiculous and petty. I don't believe these people actually take magic seriously because, and, and I, I think a lot of my arguments are pretty well spelled out in the piece itself. If you really believe that you're dealing with whatever you want to call it, I mean, powers, energies, entities, so on and so forth, that are, that are powerful enough to change the course of history for you, why would they? What's in it for them? I mean, why do they care about, you know, temporal politics? You know, I mean, just basically policy differences that are so minor kind of reminds me of, of what Freud had said about, you know, the Catholics and the Protestants in, in Northern Ireland is that, the, you know, their the squabbles with, with each other at the time of his writing were so intense and so vitriolic because they were so similar. And, and I think that's part of, you know, what we're seeing today is, you know, what Freud called the, um, the narcissism of small differences. So why would they care? I mean, if, if you're talking about an entity, say, you know, say you're going to call on Hecate, right? This is a, a being, an entity, a deity, however you choose to describe her, that's seen horrors on a, on a scale that are unimaginable to us, you know, that has seen, you know, tyrants that we can't even conceive of anymore, you know, even in the time of, of ancient Greece. I mean, you know, one of the things I had written about was um, the first uh, first Oracle War. I, think, I forget the exact name, but there was a war being fought over the Oracle of Delphi. And the, the, the winners of this war, like, literally annihilated everyone in the um, city-state that they were, they were fighting with. You know, there was this um, city-state that was trying to take over the, the Oracle of Delphi, and some other city-state came along and said, no, you're, you're doing no such fucking thing, and then defeated them in battle and, like, literally annihilated everyone. So somebody like Hecate or somebody like Isis or Ishtar or Inanna, or, you know, I'm, I'm not exactly sure, Sekhmet, I don't know, you know, Bast, you know, you, you name whatever <laughs> deity that they might be choosing to uh, commerce with. Um, why, why do they care about this? They don't care about this. I mean, most people now don't even care about it anymore. It's just, you know, it's just one of these kind of partisan things that just get people excited for a short period of time and then just nobody cares about it. But we're like, why would this being who's been around for thousands of years and, like I said, has seen civilizations die care about this so you can't have it both ways you either take this seriously you take these beings seriously or you admit on a fundamental level that you're not serious that that you're bothering these deities with things that are not important to them and and here's the other issue and and this is an issue that, that Greer brought up is that it, it usually <laughs> backfires I um, mean, you know, what was the result of this um, this little LARP here? I mean, you know, Kavanaugh was confirmed. Ford was was basically, you know, I mean, I believe her lawyers. There's a complaint against them in the in the bar association. I mean, she just went, she vanished back into the woodwork. Um, this Michael Avenatti guy, who I'm not entirely sure is not some sort of Donald Trump plant. <laughs> I, I'm not exactly sure that this guy isn't secretly working for uh, for Trump. He lost this case, you know, for Stormy Daniels, and now she's got to pay. Trump X millions of dollars, and then, you know, he's now being investigated by the Senate. So, I mean, it's like, I've just seen this backfire so often. It's, I, I just, I don't understand why anybody would want to, you know, dip their toes in these waters. The only reason that I can come up with is that they don't really take this stuff seriously. This is just basically a way to get attention on social media, and it just bumbles from one misadventure to the other. And I don't think Black magic in particular. I mean, when you talk about curses and hexes, I mean, you don't you don't screw around with that stuff. I mean, however you choose to interpret it, whether it's just you know on a psychological or subliminal or or psychic or, or magical level, you, you just you know you don't screw around with that. And and another thing that I have to say is that why would you assume that these men who are in power in in this occult, unabashedly you know occult drenched city, you know, it's a capital city. Why would any of these people assume that they don't have their own magicians working for them? You know what I'm saying? It's just it, to me, it's like these are people who grew up reading Harry Potter novels and think this stuff is just a game. People are going to disagree or, or agree with me, but that's just the way I see it. Well, 
Later in the post, you said, I don't want to give this nonsense more credit than it's worth, but it speaks to a larger issue that's been weighing on my mind lately, and that's the fact that more and more people out there seem to be acting as if they're demonically possessed. <laughs> and then you also wrote that the constant barrage of occult symbolism, uh, whether overt or covert, isn't being shoved down everyone's throats just for shits and giggles. And then you compared this to ancient Babylon, uh, particularly during the Neo-Assyrian period. So a few things to take in there, but why do you think people are acting possessed, and why does it remind you of Babylon? Well, I mean, look what happened today. Somebody went into it synagogue in, in Pittsburgh and just started shooting people. You know, we're just seeing so much of this. I mean, I see so much on social media, just people who are unhinged with, with hatred. And I, I, I see that as demonic. To me, lines have been crossed. Lines have been crossed from like, I'm really angry and mind controlled. And I'm going to say a bunch of wacky things to like, I, I really think these people are demonically possessed. Look at that kid in, in Parkland, that kid Cruz. I mean, he said it. he felt like his, his mind was being controlled by a demon. I mean, we see so much of this with a lot of these mass shooters and a lot of people who just do like horrible things to other people. I mean, they, they, they will tell you outright, you know, and they'll tell you very like reasonably and relatively cogently that, that that's exactly what they think they're dealing with. So, I mean, again, I mean, it's like there it is. I mean, just this morning. You know, I mean, I, I see that as a demonic act. People might disagree with me. People might think it's sort of an expression of political extremism. I, I don't. I see it as demonic. But as far as um, as Babylon is concerned, I mean, I've done a lot, I have a lot of books on what's called Assyriology. And Assyriology is basically the study of everything from Sumer to, you know, the Seleucid Empire, all the way up to, you know, Cyrus and, and, and Xerxes and, and all these uh, people who had um, conquered Babylon you know, and the Neo-Syrian Empire of Babylon was the last, what people would call Semitic Empire, you know, and Semitic being a description of people from the Levant and Syria, you know, it's really a description of, of, of a language family, but, you know, people speaking this language. So, you know, you had a lot of tribes that were, were roughly contiguous and roughly, you know, sort of loosely amalgamated. So the Neo-Assyrians were sort of the, the final Semitic empire before the conquest by, by Cyrus the Great. Now, why I compare this to, compare what we're seeing today to, to that period is that religion, as it's commonly understood, is not really the way things worked at that time and in that place. You know, really what you had is that, you know, you had a lot of people who had household shrines and you had a lot of people who practiced magic what came to be known as Chaldean magic. I mean, you know, that, that time and that place was so well known for magic that, you know, it really became sort of almost synonymous with it. And, you know, the term Chaldean magic, which is actually a misnomer, but it's kind of the way people understood it for, you know, up until fairly recently. But what had happened is that, you know, magic was so pervasive and so widely practiced that people were constantly, I, I think they became crippled by superstition. You know, they became crippled by it. They they were so there was so much paranoia about who was working against me magically and you know everything that you can possibly imagine. If somebody got you know the flu, it was because they were being cursed by a witch. And the other thing too is you know this whole idea of demonology. I mean, most of our uh, modern understanding of, of demonology really comes from Babylon. I mean, most of the demons, you know, they've been given either you know Hebrew or Latin names. But they all basically come from Mesopotamia, however you choose. And then they go very far back. But it really got to the point in that period that everyone perceived demons being everywhere. And I think that this kind of hurt the body politic to the sense that it became open to conquests by the Persians. Now, the interesting thing is that you had like musical chairs going back all the way to the Sumerians and the Sumerians were said to have displaced a previous civilization and, you know, the Sumerians to the Akkadians, you know, and then you had all these other groups wandering in from North, South, East and West and, and taking over for a couple hundred years and, and, you know, building some sort of empire for a couple hundred years before giving way to the next empire. So I think that at this Neo-Assyrian period, you really You've heard about the you know the libraries at at Babylon, you know, but those libraries were originally collected to amass magical texts. 
So I, I think that um, I'm going to mispronounce his name right now. Asher Vanipal, uh, you know, his library was was constructed to collect uh, magical texts, specifically magical texts. And, it, you know, it sort of ties into you know, a friend of mine told me when you know, I was having a discussion, I was having lunch with a friend of mine one time. We were talking about the occult. We were talking about magic and things like that. And he said, the problem with the occult is that after a while, people tend to get very paranoid. People tend to become kind of hyper vigilant, and I, I think that that is, in some ways, justified because you know we, we we've seen we'll go back to things like you know the Golden Dawn and you know all these magical wars that that Crowley was having with people and and you know, all this sort of back and forth. I think it tends to sort of break down eventually, you know. And magic doesn't always work. I mean, maybe it doesn't usually work. You know, I mean, I don't know. I, I'm not really that seriously involved in it. But I think when it doesn't work, you know, people are necessarily going to believe that it's because somebody, some other more powerful magician was, you know, counteracting their spells or, some, you know, had summoned some demon or some demon just, you know, noticed them and wanted to, you know, screw around with their lives and stuff. So I think that, you know, various forms of magic, you know, maybe even forms that aren't necessarily recognized as such. You know, but I mean, look at the whole thing with like me magic and, during the election, I had so many people, so many people emailing me and messaging me and commenting and, you know, the whole thing with Keck and, and, and that whole me magic and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's just, it's just everywhere. And look at all the shows, the TV shows that are about magic. You know, now you have this um, new Sabrina series, which, you know, she's a satanic witch and all this kind of thing. So, I mean, the stuff is so prevalent that I think it just sort of changes the tone and the shape of the culture. And I, I think in, in many important ways that, you know, I don't want to say demonic as far as Pazuzu or, you know, Asmodeus or, you know, whoever is running around and possessing people. But I, I see it more as like a demonic zeitgeist that, that people are, are, are being possessed and or obsessed by like a spirit of the times that I believe is demonic. I think one more quote that sort of ties that up really nicely from your blog is you said, that's what troubles me, since even a cursory glance at some of the books from this era, it depicts a population teetering on the verge of, you guessed it, a mass psychic meltdown. So I think that pairs pretty well, as you just outlined here. And I'm glad you mentioned that Sabrina show, because I was going to ask you about that. I just watched the uh, the first episode last night, actually, and holy shit, man, that is just drenched. I mean, it's obviously about witchcraft, but the way that they position it, have you seen it yet? Well, you know, it's funny you should mention that because I have a post in my queue that's been sitting there for months because I, I wanted to write about the comic, the original comic series that the, the TV series is based on. Because sometime, I don't know if it was last year or the year before, they had published a, um, a Sabrina series, this new sort of model, demonic Sabrina. And when I read it, I was like, wow, this is really dark and this is really nasty. And this is really, this is not like, you know, this isn't Buffy. You know what I'm saying? This is not right. like um, tongue in cheek kind of knowing. I mean, this is like serious death and blood magic and Satanism. And I was like, why is this being marketed to, to teenage girls? I just saw that that came up on, on my Netflix today, so I, I do want to watch it. But, I, you know, I don't hold up much hope for it to be anything other than, you know, a shit show. Uh, that's the best way to describe it. It's it's very dark, and I'll look forward to your take on this whenever you watch it. But I also saw a review of it this morning, too, that said it was totally bingeable. So there's that, too. You know, back to that blog post real quick about the, the Black Magic LARP, I guess. You mentioned in there a book titled... Mysteries and Romances of the World's Greatest Occultists by the Irish pop esoterica author, and correct me if I'm pronouncing the name wrong, but is it Cairo? Why did you mention this book? What's the significance of it, and how does it tie in here? Well, it's a book I read a number of years ago, and it was a real uh, sobering experience because, I mean, I'm sure a lot of your listeners are, are familiar with this, but just there are a lot of occupational hazards in being an occultist or a, magi a magician. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's not really like the healthiest um, career choice. And Cairo sort of documented how many of these people came to you know pretty bad ends. And I'm not sure at the time if I was working on my Lucifer Rising article for Classic Rock. I did this article for Classic Rock 
which is a, one of the major glossy rock magazines out of the UK. And it was actually their best selling issue ever. And it was about uh, Jimmy Page and Bobby Beausoleil. I actually had an, a number of, I sort of had some marathon conversations with Bobby Beausoleil, but also Ken Thanger. But I was sort of looking at things that people like Adam Goreilly had published about this. And I think Dave McGowan had done some work even as early as this. I'm not exactly sure. I'll have to check the timeline. But that was, you know, sort of really on my mind because I had gone out to, um, not a lot of people realize this, but Alistair Crowley is quote unquote buried not 20 minutes from my house in, in a town called Hampton, New Jersey. And his second in command, Carl Germer, had bought a farm in that town and had scattered, basically scattered Crowley's ashes on cow flaps. You know, it's pretty grim end of a man who probably pictured, you know, tabernacles being raised in his honor. That had all sort of come around the same time that I was reading this book, you know, by Cairo. And, you know, he's talking about, of course, you know, much earlier people. I don't think he even mentions Crowley in the book. I'll, I'll have to see what year it was written, but I, I don't believe he mentions Crowley. And he certainly doesn't match, mention Jack Parsons. You know, and Jack Parsons is sort of everywhere now. There's that series on CBS. And I just watched an episode of Lore, which is unbelievably terrible. You know, it's this sort of like moonlighting version of Jack Parsons, which is just absolutely risable. But so the other thing, too, is that um, so Kenneth Anger, I had interviewed him and it was not a good experience. And one of the reasons why it was not a good experience is that he had been homeless when I was trying to get in touch with him. I mean, this is an 86 year old man who's homeless. And I believe he had been arrested for um, uh, assaulting a woman at this welfare hotel that he'd been living in. And, you know, it's basically, and, you know, he we had to pay him like X hundred a month dollars to get him to even talk because he had like, he literally had no money for food. And first of all, I just thought just on artistic level, this is disgraceful. I mean, Kenneth Anger is, is, is an artist who has influenced generations of filmmakers and video makers and, you know, commercial makers. I mean, this, this, this should never happen. I mean, this is a, a man who has influenced the way people watch film. It's, it's just, it's disgraceful, but Sad to say, I mean, a lot of his problems are, you know, self-induced. And he seems in, in more recent years to have kind of gotten his act his act together. But it just depressed the hell out of me. You know, it really did. Because, you know, I'm not I'm certainly not an, a fan of his, but I certainly I recognize, you know, that he was a revolutionary artist, a groundbreaking artist. I mean, you know, people like Martin Scorsese say that he was very heavily influenced by Kenneth Anger. So, you know, I just think that, in a lot of cases that magic and occultism will take people who are very bright and very promising and, and very have a lot to offer the world and destroy their lives. In, in many cases, some people sort of recover. I mean, you know, Jimmy Page sort of recovered from his um, magical beating and, and, you know, Bowie recovered from his magical beating. And, you know, and I don't know Alan Moore's particular circumstances. And I, I think that you know, I think he's more sort of a scholar of, of the occult than, than an actual practitioner. Uh, and I'm sure I'll get a lot of heat for that. But I mean, I've actually spoken to him personally. So, you know, whatever. But I, I, I mean, I think that the people who sort of had, I'm not exactly sure which, what's the difference is, but, you know, Jack Parsons, before he died, he basically, he'd lost everything, everything that he'd worked for. I mean, this is a guy who should have been a, a billionaire at this point in time. And, and he'd lost everything. He had everything taken away from him. And that's, you know, this is a guy who invented solid rocket fuel. How is he not a billionaire? So I, I think that um, magic and the occult can, can really destroy people's lives. And I think that that's something that too many people don't pay attention to. And it's unfortunate. And I think that, um, you know, getting back to this whole thing with Brooklyn, I mean, nobody's going to follow up with any of these people, but it would not surprise me in the slightest if everyone involved in that ritual ran into some really shit luck in the next few months. You know what I mean? I've really ran into a wood chipper, so to speak, on a, on a magical level, because I just think the gods would be offended or the, the spirits or the demons or whoever would just be offended by, by that whole thing. And, you know, again, I mean, this is like, I'm saying this stuff not because I, I'm trying to discourage people from, you know, from researching the occult or practicing magic. I mean, I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying, you know, do it right. Because more people than you can possibly imagine, people who are much smarter than any of us will ever be. I mean, people who, who you know, like I said in the article, would make Einstein weep 
with envy. You know, they were so brilliant and their lives were just totally destroyed. And uh, it's it's a real it's a real shame. And I, I think that it's something that anybody interested in the occult or magic or ritual magic really needs to pay very close attention to. I would agree with that 100 percent, man. And you also recently watched a, a dark song for the first time. I believe you referred to it in jest as a documentary. Uh, what do no, you think of that? Jest. Oh, OK. No. OK. Well, what do you think of that film then? Oh, I think it's brilliant. I, I think it's a documentary. I think it's um, I, I think it's a very truthful and accurate depiction of the way this thing, the way this stuff really works. I think that uh, it's very powerful and very honest and very sobering in a way. But I think that it, it shows shows how this stuff goes, you know. And, and this is something that you know, if you really dig into this stuff, you'll see, you know, you'll you'll get a real sense of this. And um, yeah, I just thought it was is just really brilliant from start to finish, and just so real, just so real. I'm not exactly sure what inspired you know the guy who wrote it and directed it, but uh, you know he certainly knows he certainly knows his stuff, and I, I think he just did a brilliant brilliant job at it. And you know another thing that I wanted to sort of mention is that you know we have this whole. I'll try not to you know give spoilers here, but we have this whole consolation universe of demons and angels that that sort of hover around this whole story and i think that um this is something that i've been thinking a lot, about a lot is that you know when people say you know this goddess or that god or this angel you know it's it's really just all nomenclature and cultural baggage you know i just think that these whatever beings you're talking about are all, are all just basically kind of the same thing you know it's just people perceive them or, or name them in different ways so again spoilers spoilers whatever i mean you know in dark song sort of the denouement i mean that that may as well have been i don't know athena minerva i mean it may as well have been any number of gods or goddesses you know that the figure is, is very androgynous i mean but you know one of the things that i've been pointing out on the blog is that if you really look at traditional christian art the angels you know basically cross dressers i mean they're they're extremely androgynous to the point of being really womanly and you know even the arch archangels so I just think that it, it's all sort of a, a continuum, and I think the Dark Song really concretized that. And it, something that it really reminded me of, a movie that's one of my top, I'd say it's in my top three uh, movies, is uh, Jacob's Ladder. And the, the way that that sort of depicted demons and angels and, and purgatory and so on and so forth. And it's interesting, too, because if, I've, I've actually read the, um, I read the original screenplay in full. And uh, it's kind of dumb. You know, really so much of that film was um, Adrian Lyne, who, the writer, who I'm actually, I, I actually, big admirer of his work, uh, Bruce Joel Rubin, uh, who wrote the original screenplay. He, when he met with Adrian Lyne, Adrian Lyne said, this is just, people are going to laugh at this. You know, I mean, we need to develop a new vocabulary, you know, a new visual vocabulary for these demons that he keeps running into. And we can't just have it be, you know, guys with horns and, and forked tails and everything like that because people are just going to think that's stupid, you know? And, and I think that was a very brilliant decision on, on his behalf. And I think some of that power, some of that energy really carries through to a dark song. I mean, I, I, I just, I can't recommend it highly enough. You know, I had sort of a discussion with uh, Gordon White about it and, and he said Requiem is better, you know, for telling a very similar story. And, and, you know, in many ways, I agree with him, but, you know, I don't think that diminishes any of the power of a dark song at all. Well, Chris, if people want to embrace the mystery of The Secret Sun, where can they find you and keep up with you? Uh, Secretsun.blogspot.com. That's pretty much where anything I have to say will be said, unless it's putting up like cute cat or, you know, cute baby videos. And then I'll put that up on Twitter. You know, my Twitter is uh, Secret Sun Speaks. Yeah, you know, sometimes I'll post things that are a little more profound, but yeah, you know, Twitter is so toxic and so full of demonic hatred that I try to, um, you know, sort of off offer a counterbalance, a countervailing force to all that uh, anger and, and hatred. Yeah, if there's one thing I could use more of, it's more cute cat videos. That's for sure. So you can never, you, you can literally never have enough. 
I mean, <laughs> you know, because like you're never satisfied. You're never like, OK, that's enough cute cat videos. It's like, no, I need more or cute dog videos or, you know, cute babies or whatever. It's like, no, I, I, I need to see cuteness. I need to see more cuteness in my life. You know, baby elephants are great, too. I mean, just an entire animal kingdom that is just full of goodness. There's that new uh, Dumbo flick coming out, I think. Is it next year sometime? I'm not sure. Yeah, but, that'll be really interesting. Yeah, yeah. These... You know, who, who of my generation was not completely traumatized by the original? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, these Disney movies. I think it's a Disney movie. These these keep getting uh, weirder and weirder for sure. So, Chris Knowles, hey, man, a really nice chatting with you. I appreciate you making as much time for me as you did. Look forward to talking to you again sometime soon. Rock on. Thank you. And there you have it. My thanks again to Chris Knowles. Please do check out his blog, The Secret Son. I'll tell you the sinks he points out there just have to be seen with your own eyes to really make sense of. And the timing of his It's No Game post about the black magic LARPing and how dangerous it is, that was quite synchromistic, I guess. He published it just a couple days before our scheduled chat, and I actually rearranged pretty much the entire conversation to accommodate that topic because I thought it was worthy of discussion, and it is. Obviously, you heard his take on it, and the blog entry is linked in the show notes if you want to read it in its entirety. You also heard Chris reference John Michael Greer's take on it, which was very similar. That is up on JMG's blog, also linked in the show notes. And former guest Thomas Sheridan also shared a similar take in a recent YouTube video of his, which is also linked if you're interested. And, you know, I get it. People are upset about, I don't know, damn near everything, it seems. Everything has become so politicized, which makes everything inherently contentious and divisive. And I guess naturally you want to exert whatever power or authority you have as an individual over the things you think could be improved. But when you go external with that, and when you start to interfere with other people's lives, whether it's physically or emotionally or psychologically or, in this case, magically, you really are putting yourself on a dangerous path, and you don't need to be some adept magician or scholar to understand this or understand this. And hey, we've all done it. I mean, I've done it. I've done and said things to other people that have interfered in their lives, and it's resulted in some bad juju for me. And analyzing those experiences has shown me that nothing good has ever come from me trying to exert my individual power or authority over another individual. And I'm sure nothing good has happened to those of you who've done it or had it done to you. Honestly, I thought we were all sick of being treated like that and sick of seeing others treated like that, which is why I thought we came to places like this in the first place. I thought we came to places like this to learn how to be better, to learn how to stop participating in this silly little fucking LARP that we've let control us all these years. And that's, to me, the best thing about something like the Secret Sun blog. You see the grand LARP unfolding in real time, and you can't do anything but just sit back and laugh at it. Because whatever's going on at that scale of our shared reality is beyond your control. And you just have to laugh at how silly you've acted and reacted all these years. Your metaphysics don't matter at that point. Your politics don't matter at that point. At the end of the day, whatever lenses you put on to color your worldview, they don't matter. What does matter is how you treat people. You know, so get off social media and stop trying to hex people who haven't harmed you at all. Talk to your neighbors. Talk to folks working in your local supermarket or a coffee shop. Talk to people who disagree with you. Believe it or not, you can do that. And you can do it in a mature, respectful manner. It took time for me to learn how to do that, believe me. And I'm still learning how to best do it. But it can be done. And let's stop thinking we have to control every little thing and everyone else. And let's just reconnect with ourselves and with the people who really matter in our lives. And just tying this back to something Chris talks about, I think this may be one reason why we've seen this uptick in water and siren symbolism. I take that as a metaphor of being lured to the death of a part of yourself that's no longer serving you. Hopefully, it's giving you the strength to heal old wounds and stop picking those scabs. Anyway, in the Patreon extension, Chris and I chatted about the increase of siren symbolism in culture, Supernova 1987A, Chris's definition and views of the apocalypse, hint, a rather Gnostic, uh, the constellation Lyra, star maps, sound and sonic frequency bridging dimensions, James Joyce's fractal writing, this recent story about a massive attack album being coded into DNA, that's fucking weird, and then we ended on what music actually is. So if you want to hear that extension and all others past and present, check out patreon.com slash occulture.com. 
And a shout out to some new patrons who hopped on board this esoteric endeavor last week. My thanks to Soroya, Kevin, Tanya, Owen, and Cody. And honestly, my thanks to all of you who re-up every month with your continued support. It is much appreciated and helps me get one step closer to ending the LARP of the 8, uh, used to be 9 to 5 day job. Man, I am sick and tired of playing that game, as I'm sure a lot of you are as well. Which reminds me that it is about that time. So, until next time, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Please rewind this cassette.